Okay, a wonderful good evening and namaste and aloha. Um, we are, uh, you're joining us in our very first event to celebrate the uh, opening of the World Tourism Network. So this is a new one for all of us. And we're not perfect, uh, but we're trying to make the system work. So you are definitely our guinea pig here. We have the system and you're now live and not only on the World Tourism Network event page, on the homepage, but you're also live on Isobo News and on 16 other publications on various um, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple, in podcast, you name it. So we're out here and um, what we're doing is we're having events like this one. And so far there are 14 plans and we're gonna have more the entire month till the 19th of December. And they're going to be played during our official opening event and keynote event on the 9th and the 10th of December, but they're also played repeatedly and constantly on our network. So you will see this on in, in all forms and we will, after this, if you're registered, we will email you also a link uh, to our, both to our YouTube and to our Vimeo page where you can easily uh, pull it up and, and, and watch it anytime, or it will be on livestream.travel. So again, welcome. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, and um, I'm joining you from Honolulu, Hawaii, and our guest today is uh, my old friend and um, colleague, Mr. Pankai. He is uh, joining us from Nepal. Namaste, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jürgen. Namaste from Kathmandu, Aloha. And we have the panelist all the way from Australia, Julie Kent. We have two panelists in Susi Ladikari from Kathmandu and Amrita Gyamali again from Kathmandu. So first and foremost, uh, let me congratulate you, WTN launching. It is an amazing time and this can't be, there can't be a better time than this one. We <laughs> really need to be resilient and keep going. So congratulations Thomas for your initiative and we are really pumped up to take this forward. And I'm really happy to know that this is the first event of this type or this kind to begin with. So let me welcome once again, Julie, Susil and Amrita. For the benefit of our participants and the guests, let me introduce who they are and what exactly are we going to do. Julie, she is an avid traveler. She met with an accident when she was 19 years old and she turned into a quadriplegic, but that did not stop her. She is grandmother of four children full of life, an avid learner. And she traveled last year to Tibet. You can imagine on, a, on her wheelchair, she went right up to the base camp of Everest. And that was just the beginning. Her motto in life is, I'm limitless. Susil Adhikari, a good friend of mine from Nepal, he is a visually impaired, is blind, He's a co-founder of Bright Star Society. He's a travel enthusiast. And he's an activist for youth empowerment and disability rights. And he has traveled extensively, Europe, US, Asia, you name it, India, Nepal. And our third panelist, Amrita Gemwali, uh, she's also a wheelchair user. Uh, after a car accident when she was only three years old. She is co-founder of Saksham Foundation. And she's been working relentlessly for physical and to, to break the barriers, be it physical or attitudinal. And Amrita has also traveled extensively in Asia, Europe, and the US. So with three amazing panelists, now let me start the conversation. And as you can guess, once again, I welcome all the participants who are uh, live, who joined a Zoom session. 
are we ready to travel? So let me begin with Julie. Julie, if I may ask you, why do you travel? What is your motivation behind traveling? Julie, you need to unmute. Okay. I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, there yeah. we go. Okay. Good. Yeah, no, I um, first traveled to experience the different cultures and just get a different experience on life and in general. Yeah. And also to travel to Nepal and Tibet was a lifelong dream of mine too. They're two places I've wanted to travel since I first had my accident. So getting there was a dream come true. And, um, meeting the people and experiencing the different things that I was able to experience gave me a lot of insight into different cultures and into who I was as a person as well. Thank you, Julie. So meeting people and getting insights are your key motivator. Now let me move on to Susil Adhikari. Will you please unmute yourself and join us, Susil? Okay, so here I am a Susil, just like the Japanese food called Susi. So uh, I, I travel because I always love to experience new things uh, in the world. Uh, that could be either food or meeting people, building networking opportunities, or to share uh, the insight. Uh, it's kind of, you know, traveling is a very burning passion of mine that I've been doing for over a decade uh, to, to, broad, to broaden my horizon of thinking and also uh, getting new experiences, meeting new people, cultivating new friendships. Yeah, like that. Thank you, Susil. So it's a broadening new horizon and cultivating new friends. Now, let me ask the same question to Amrita. What is your motivation behind travel? Thank you. I travel because I believe uh, I am an adventurous person. So, uh, and I, I love to uh, explore and navigate myself in a different places because whenever I travel, I feel very confident and positive. I also love to um, learn and grow myself. So that's the main thing. I love to travel. That's why I travel, yeah. So thank you, Amrita. Uh, if possible, Susil and Amrita, please turn on your video so we can also see you for Mute. real. Uh, audio, uh, app, start with app. I believe my start. internet is not so okay. strong, so I try. Um, then it's fine, it's fine, if possible. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> The internet is very excellent. You know, you. So now, despite of having your barriers, whether it's mobility impairment or visual impairment, the travel has given you more reason to leave the moment and explore, as you said, cultivate new friendship, exploring new places and gaining new insights. Now, if I go back to Julie, Julie, when you traveled to Nepal in 2018, that was your maiden trip out of Australia. It was. It was the first time I had traveled overseas. Uh, not long. Um, I'd never traveled. I traveled interstate, but never on, yeah, never overseas. So it was a really good learning experience, just learning how to go through customs, go through checkouts. Um, yeah, lots of different, different, yeah, experiences. It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was. Well, this is, this is fascinating fact. To overcome because like I'd anticipated it in my mind, I had an idea of what it's going to be like, but when it came to it, it was nothing like I'd, I'd pictured it to be, but it was more than what I'd expected. Thank you. So 
here it's a fascinating fact that normally people think Nepal or the Himalayan region is for extremely adventurous lot who go to climb mountain or go for trekking, who goes for trekking for weeks. You chose Nepal, Tibet, for your maiden trip. So what is your experience after that? Did you overcome your barrier, your limited belief, and you become limitless? Did that trip help you? That's where that that started. That's where it began within the fall because there was lots of things that I'm, the, in the pool, the access yeah. was completely different to where it is in Australia, mm-hmm. but the people over there helped me overcome those limits and those barriers because they saw me as a person. They didn't see me in the wheelchair. It was the first time, I think, since I'd had my accident that I'd actually felt that home and that warming from other people that care. So the limit... So even though I had limitations, it was having the support to overcome them while I was there. Thank you, Julie. Now let me direct the very same question to Susil. Uh, Mm -hmm. Which trip made you feel more liberated in your personal journey of exploring places as you are a travel enthusiast? Uh-huh. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, you know, I have a different travel experiences from underdeveloped countries to uh, most developed country uh, countries in the world, uh, from Mongolia to um, United States of America or other European countries like Ch- uh, Germany or Spain. So I would say, uh, in terms of uh, you know, very most comfort zone, um, I would say United States. Is the most accessible country for me because uh, when I entered into the land of uh, America, I felt that it was just like the new world for me because you know everything was pretty new. Even you know being in the escalator, uh, like you know being uh, in the train or navigating solo to different parts of America by myself, it gave me more liberation as I uh, was able to you know travel without having any sort of, you know, worries or obstacles. Uh, for example, like, you know, in Nepal, when we navigate in the busy streets of Kathmandu, there are a lot of obstacles, a lot of potholes, a lot of, you know, barriers are there. Even uh, I get a lot of, you know, difficulties finding washrooms or finding bus stops. Sometimes, you know, vehicles do not be stop uh, uh, where they should be, you know, stopping. But unlike um, Nepal, US was you know, pretty different in terms of accessibility. And I was able to travel of my own uh, anywhere I wanted to be and uh, w- without having any sight and assistance. That was the most like, you know, Thank accessible you. experiences for me. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you for sharing your experience, having difficulties and overcoming that in the US because the facilities were more, much more friendly and accessible. Now, let me quickly ask Amrita, you've also traveled in Nepal, India, uh, Europe, and US. So what was your liberating moment uh, in the journey? Um, I was in India about uh, four years ago. So I I found the uh, similar experiences in Nepal and India because of, you know, due to inaccessible environment. Uh, so I found the similar experiences uh, because um, most of the buildings were not accessible, even the roads, footpaths were not accessible. So um, it was a similar experience. And my last uh, visit was in the USA. I was there for my fellowship. So I stayed there for four months. So it was a completely different uh, experience for me because, you know, I could not like sleep, I was so overwhelmed thinking like um, everything was so accessible for me. I I could go to, uh, I could travel myself. I could go to, I could use the train, bus, um, everything by myself. So I was so overwhelmed. And and, um, I got got an opportunity to experience different different experts of my life. and, And also I saw the adaptive technologies and um, 
inclusive technologies there. My one of my best experience was to you know um, rock climbing and uh, hand cycling. So I I could never imagine myself doing rock climbing and hand cycling. So yeah, it was a very uh, surreal experience for me in the USA. Yeah. Thank you, Amrita. So that is uh, now, if I could gather correctly, tourism or exploration gave you fear to freedom. Earlier, you were confined in this part that, okay, there are no accessible facilities, so you would not go and explore. But as you explore more and realize that you could do rock climbing and you can do the adventures that you had never imagined. So moving forward, what as the panelists said, the lack of facilities, lack of accessible facilities, mm -hmm. lack of uh, friendly facilities are the number one barrier, not the disabilities. This yeah. reminds me, my mentor and friends of you, many of you, uh, Dr. Scott Rains, who came to Nepal 2014 and we could take forward the new initiative in the Himalaya. He was a wheelchair user. We have been celebrating his birthday in Nepal, 27th November. Last year, exactly today, 30th November, we did organize uh, an excursion in the UNESCO heritage site of Patan. Amrita was also one of the participants along with many Nepalese friends. Uh, if the bandwidth allows, I'll just quickly Nexus show a Nexus picture. Um, Alert, there you can see Nexus the pagodas uh, that UNESCO heritage site of Patan and Amrita is right there. We had our friends Jamuna and many friends from Kathmandu. And well, I think the bandwidth is uh, playing a little tricky as Jorgen said that we are We've become guinea pigs, so it's fine. We'll not stop here. And there you can also see Julie enjoying Tibet right above Lake Namso. But see, mm -hmm. uh, that, that is Yandrok Lake, right? And she went yeah. up to Everest Base Camp. So I'll, I'll stop the video. But Over this Nagas, tells Nagas, us Nagas, stop. this debate has been ongoing for a long time, whether we wait for all the facility being accessible and in order, then only we start tourism. But my mentor, Scott Rains, was in denial. He said, no, you must start. And then the facilities and accessibility will fall into places. So that's what has brought us this far. Now, let me ask Amrita, since you've been traveling and advocating this, what is the right approach? Whether we wait for until everything becomes accessible and then we travel or we start traveling and then things fall into places. Um, I always tell my friends like me, especially those who use wheelchairs, never say that um, that place is not accessible so I cannot go. First go there and make aware the people <laughs> they know that they need to make the building accessible. So first, I think we need to explore ourselves. We need to go out from our house then I think people will see that there are people who are different. So yeah, I believe that we need to explore ourselves first. Yeah. Thank you, Amrita. Now I'll ask exactly the same question to Susil. From the Space, visual you. impaired travelers, what is your take? I think uh, first we should take initiation from our own side. Once we go out and once we explore the things, and then people, you know, begin to notice us. Uh, like you know, when I travel, uh, holding my white cane, and people say, "Oh yeah, you are also here." I say that you know the things that people can see, we can feel the moment. We can feel the nature. We can feel the sight. So so we need to we need to we don't have to wait some somebody like you know who could start like you know hiking or uh, arranging other you know uh, things but we should take our initiation from our own side and we should just you know go and we should just start from our own so that the facilities will be added you know gradually later uh yeah that's what i thank you Susil. Like. now yeah i would like to add for the benefit of all the audience here and those will watch later the recording person 
Nepal has recently to uh, have taken this initiative very recently. Um, to be precise, it is only 20 after 2014. It has been Alert. organized. With the but there were travelers in the, who were coming to Nepal who were just people with disabilities. We don't have any record for that, right? But over the last seven years, it has been a lot more organized. And here I must mention that 2018, we did, we did organize uh, a conference in Okra, uh, which uh, also inaugurated a trail, which was accessible trail, 1.3 kilometers, almost in the gateway to Annapurna trekking uh, trail. Though the trail was very short by length, 1.3 kilometers, but the message was very strong. Even a country which is perceived as not so easy and accessible destination is now taking initiative. And of course, Nepal Tourism Board and various organization associations uh, stepped in to make it accessible. So the initiative has gone building brick by brick. So there, I would love to hear from Julie since she came to Nepal. She spent almost two months, went to Tibet, again came back and had there been no COVID, she would have been in Bhutan perhaps this around this time. So Julie, what do you think? Uh, how would you as a traveler with disabilities or travel in wheelchair, would travel now in post-COVID scenario or in this unprecedented challenge, how do you expect to travel again? And what are the things you would consider the most? My trip to Nepal opened my eyes to a lot of different um, pieces of myself. And I think even though Nepal is not not accessible for and the wheelchair the streets like you said they're not paved they're not smooth but I think with determination and just the willingness to go there and just be a part of the culture and the people without any expectations I, it's achievable and I didn't have I didn't find any real difficulties in assessing that at all because I had like I said earlier I had the people with me that could help overcome the physical obstacles to get through. Uh, like in Shitwan Jungle, we had the bathroom in the hotel there. You couldn't get a wheelchair through the door in the bathroom. That was just a matter of finding alternate ways of like lifting into the shower and the bathroom and stuff. So the physical challenges and limitations are achievable and you can overcome them, but you've just don't place any expectations before you go there. And Nepal is one place that I would love to go back to again. Mm -hmm. And the accommodation at the ambassador was more than accessible because they accommodated everything that I needed, really. There wasn't any major limitations that I couldn't do when I was at the when I was in there. Thank you, Julie. So as the data shows of 1.3 billion international travelers who cross, who cross the international border, 10% of total number of international travel have some sort of disabilities, be it visible or invisible. So that market is totally untapped. The good thing is, as Julie mentioned, even hotels in Kathmandu have started taking this initiative to make the bathrooms accessible, to make the lobby accessible, mm -hmm. to make the rooms accessible. Yes, there is a law. However, the compliance is not that great. So what we have seen off late is hotels are building the facilities accessible, keeping the travelers with disability in mind because it is a segment that is paying pretty well. When Julie came to Nepal, she had two 
attendants or companions who came with her. And imagine you can do the math when she stayed here for two months, a little over two months, that generated 180 room nights of business. So this segment is definitely not a low ill segment. So there I would like to forward or pass this to Amrita as you've traveled in, in Nepal and in other places, when you travel post COVID, what one thing you want to be taken care of for the benefit of people in business? Um, sorry? Amrita, my question is, mm -hmm. once you start traveling again, let's hope and pray that everything gets back to normalcy by the first quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. Then when you choose to travel out of Nepal or within Nepal, what one thing you want to be taken care of so you feel more comfortable and at ease to take up the trips again? Um, I think it should start from um, public transportation because I, I, I find it very difficult, especially if I travel from public transportation, um, like I, I don't find an accessible toilet, public toilet. So it, this is one of the most challenges. So I would like to see an accessible um, uh, public toilet and also the hotels because there are there are big huge hotels that are being made accessible recently but we all cannot afford you know five star or three star hotels so I would like to see even a small hotel that is accessible for everyone yeah so more facilities uh, which are accessible uh, accommodation uh, also the accommodation and services and products. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. I, I pass on the very same question to Sushil. Uh, from the visually impaired traveler's perspective, what are the things that you want to be assured of? Sushil. Before my I would like to be considered as a person, then only my disability comes, right? Uh, so right to travel is my human rights first. And wherever I stay, whether that could be a B and b like in a small kind of hostel or big fancy hotel. So for them, uh, I'm their client. So if I, if I am their client, so I suppose that, you know, they, they at least should have some sort of sense of, you know, giving proper orientation about their uh, room facilities or about the physical environment of their, you know, hotel areas, where the bathrooms are, where the kitchens are, like, you know, where uh, the pools are, so that I can at least have some sort of scenes um, where I can freely navigate without having any sighted assistance. So another thing is um, that I would like to be uh, sure of they take my disability not as sickness because like you know for example let's talk about um, the airport so uh, when i uh, meet the assistance that uh, you know airplane services provide they try to treat us like you know sick uh, and they 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 send us through wheelchair and i say i can walk you can just guide me and they say no 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 we can manage a wheelchair for you so if i sit on the wheelchair even though I can walk. So they completely treat us like uh, sick, you know? So that sometimes I find, you know, spoiling kind of the dignity. So, so you know, um, I think the attitude is also very important for those who are handling different business sectors in tourism, like hotels or um, other. Thank you, Susil. So the attitudinal barrier is, very important to be overcome. So as you said, safety, hygiene, 
I, I'm really curious. Earlier, I, I remember uh, you reminded me, Hello. Marco, who you also met, uh, who, yes. who came to Nepal in 2015 and did a trekking to Annapurna, 3,200 right. meter. He was really up bed and he mm -hmm. did it like it was a piece of cake for him. I was right. quite fascinated to see him. And I remember, like, as we organized this trek, like, a, a guide would just give a hand and he would hold his hand, not exactly holding, but touching his um, hand, and then he would walk very easy and comfortably. But now, with this COVID, physical distancing, mm -hmm. how does that provide a challenge um, in the new reality post-COVID, as people would definitely want to keep a comfortable physical distancing after COVID? So what is your suggestion or take to say? Uh, yeah, so uh, mostly in new places, uh, we expect um, um, a sighted person, a person, you know, to give their hand, uh, uh, you know, in which we can just hold and walk comfortably. So uh, this has been like a challenge because, you know, we need to maintain social distancing, but, you know, uh, applying all uh, safety me measures like you know just sanitizing our hands I think it's a uh, it wouldn't be that much problem if we just you know toss and like and after finishing uh, the travel and we can just you know wash our hands properly so this is how we can maintain the uh, high hands hygiene too uh, in most of the cases we might not uh, need that guidance like you know just holding someone's arms but in the new in the new places uh, we definitely prefer uh, you know someone guide us in proper thank you, way Cecil. thank you Cecil. now uh, i'll also open the q a so the participant can also contribute or, or say their knowledge and know-how um Cecil is also involved with technology uh, i'll announce shortly in about uh, five minutes uh, I'll open Q&A. Uh, Susil is also very much involved in technology. He imports technology from US, from Europe, and Nepal. But the question is not limited to Nepal. Uh, when people travel out of Nepal to Europe, US, these things would come because physical distancing has been uh, a new norm. So Julie, if I ask you, uh, when you travel next time from Australia to America or Australia to Europe, uh, what are the things that you want to be really assured of? And uh, so, you know, you feel totally at ease and your confidence is re reinstated or reinstilled. Um, let me unmute you. I think this is a bit tricky. Yes. Um, the main thing for me would just be things like the bathrooms and just checking like accessibilities um but the key to me like I've said a few times is because I am dependent and I do need assistance is just having the right support people with me because if I believe if I've got the right support people with me to help me overcome challenges like narrow doorways and stuff I can achieve anything when I travel and I think Nepal and especially some especially Tibet um proved that time and time again like some of the obstacles that we had to overcome just like you know like getting on the horse and cart and on an elephant ride you know just having the Nepalese just pick the wheelchair up and just put it on I mean that in itself is just gives you the confidence and instills the faith and just opens up, I don't know, just a piece of light that wasn't there beforehand. And um, yeah, it was just, I don't think there's anything that I can't overcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, now, yeah, Nepal. <laughs> okay. So as Susil said, the right to travel is a human right that is already agreed and endorsed by UNWTO or, or UN, um, human right. <laughs> human right, this is something what we need every day. And now we've realized after COVID that this is absolutely a basic right for everyone. So people are really eager to come out and travel again when things get back to normalcy. 
Um, hence, it is the discussion what we've gone through today, accessible tourism is not limited to people with disabilities, visible, invisible. We are also looking at uh, the elderly or senior citizen, which is growing number. People who are slow walkers, people who need some assistance while traveling. So let's not undermine that increasing segment. Uh, temporary disability, uh, people with temporary disability, pregnant women, uh, young couple traveling with kids, they all need spatial attention. And then the ramp or having other facilities would also enable them to feel much more at ease and at comfort. So the key question now is to gain the confidence back. And that very element of confidence is elusive at the moment. Uh, not only for people with disabilities, but for everyone. So I'm very much hopeful, and it was wonderful conversation, hearing your insights, um, your take about uh, the present or the past of tourism and how do we move forward. So th Thomas or Jorgen, if you allow me, I would uh, o open the q and you, you, you can feel free to write or raise your hand virtually and I will come back to you so you can ask your question. You can uh, tell who your question is directed to. There's a little blue hand actually on the right side. You can click. Yes. And then uh, Panka and I, we can actually see it. <laughs> wow, everyone. Okay, it's a quiet means the silence is golden. I can see <laughs> Stefan. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Would you please go ahead? Let me unmute you if you, or we can, we can. Yes, hello. Yes. And, and good morning. I'm, uh, I'm from Sweden. So it's uh, on, for most of you on the other side of the, the globe, I think. Uh, I have one question that is uh, really, I think it's very important uh, that is, uh, for all of you who are looking for this inclusive travel, uh, what what are are you like searching for uh, information on 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 the destination website, or do you try to connect uh, facilities like hotels and an activity uh, uh, from the activity industry or something directly, or where do you search for? for information regarding the destination, because I think there is often a lack of information regarding this everywhere. And that also puts everybody in a very strange situation, because if you, talk, if you look at the industry, for example, you, you need to solve the, the, uh, uh, the challenges on direct spot. I mean, on demand, actually. And so uh, I'm, I'm really uh, curious to know if you use the destination sites or if you uh, uh, use uh, the, uh, the facility sites, I mean, the websites for it. That would be great. I don't know whom I'm asking, but please, uh, anyone can uh, talk about it. Uh, Julie, would you like to uh, answer back since you travel intercontinental and then I'll... So how did you book your trip? Perhaps like, how did you find the local operator in Nepal? Yeah, that's right. Um, I booked my um, trip through Sandra and her partner in Frankston. They're a disabled travel agency. So I was lucky enough that they had knowledge and a background where they could kind of like guide me and they had contacts so as I traveled in the different countries they had different guides that they could connect me with um, and other travelers in the past who had experience so we had a rough idea of like what ho hotels I could were accessible um, what travel guides to use um, and that's how I ended up in the pool was with um, with Concarge and Four Seasons was through um, Sandra and so lucky enough, that was, I suppose, just a starting point. I just jumped on Google and looked in accessible travel and it just won, I know, it all just kind of like slowly connected until eventually I got on the plane and was over there. Yeah, that was 
if I if I may add uh, to what Julie said, it was uh, Trav Ability, uh, the Australian travel company by Bill Forrester, who has been a great activist and support mm -hmm. of uh, accessible tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, Susil, would you like to say how do you travel when you travel? Well, uh, most of the travel uh, plans uh, have been arranged by myself. Uh, so what I do is like, you know, I'm a backpacker too. Like, you know, I always try to, uh, you know, stay in different places. And sometimes I would be one city in the evening and reach another city in the morning. So I did a lot of, you know, solo, solo travel and exploration, especially in India, Bangladesh and United States. So whenever somebody arranged travel plan for me, so they would just, you know, uh, they, they did some sort of, you know, kind of, you know, regular travel plans. But when I chose to travel my, by myself, I, you know, just looked for uh, the accommodation, what could be cheaper and better place to stay, uh, just like, you know, hostel. And I would write them an email about my, you know, disability if they accept uh, my accommodation there. And through the prior communication, through the prior, prior research about the place where I would be visiting. So I, I, I used to like, you know, I have been, you know, finding uh, the information about those places, both through and communication, let's say. Rita, would you like to share, uh, in your case, was it already organized or? Yeah, if I travel outside my country, it, it is all, it is uh, often organized by the host. But if I travel that's inside fair, my country, fair, I, have to, I make the call to the hotel if their um, place is accessible or not. Because one of the biggest challenges is to find information on website website in Nepal. So thank you for the thank you for your question, Stefan. It's, it's a really nice question because we have a lack of information on website. So we have to make the call um, to the hotel and make sure that their place is accessible or not. Okay, Stefan, yeah, as, as Amrita said, uh, yes, thank you for that. And since you are from GSTC uh, <laughs> member, right? So obviously, do you have any, any uh, suggestion or inputs uh, how the destinations like Nepal or in this region, how can it be more accessible in terms of information as well? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your answers. I, I think uh, it's really, really highlight um, the focus that we have, that uh, there is uh, difficult to find right information. And one, one of the things I think would be great is that destinations and also, of course, uh, uh, those uh, from the industry that work within the travel industry. I mean, they, they should start, when they start to plan, it would be great if they could locally contact organizations or communities that uh, actually have uh, the disabilities. I mean, that are used to it because in the planning of uh, an experience, in the planning of exploitation of an area, or to build a hotel or a hostel or anything, they could get very use, useful information gathered locally to, to actually help to make a more inclusive tourism. And that is also very good for, I mean, in a, in a sustainable perspective, it's very important to, to have those local contacts to make. And, and that is what you have been talking about earlier as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, we like to do when we travel is to meet local people, to, to, to have a contact with the traditions, rituals, with the culture and everything. So this is something we could actually work a lot more with to, to, uh, uh, to get help from local communities that are also used to the area and the environment around us. And that, uh, because of that, it would be very, very helpful, I think, uh, to also contact organizations or communities that uh, talk about this with the disabilities or have disabilities themselves, because then we can uh, uh, together create a, a good experience for everybody. Thank you. Um, well, I, I would, uh, I think Rudolf, uh, 
Rudolph, would you like to unmute yourself and share your input? So Hello, good afternoon from Malaysia. <laughs> uh, I'm in Penang in Malaysia, near to the equator, and it's really hot here. Uh, I'm uh, following up uh, with, with you here. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, actually. I've never been to Nepal. I would love to go. Uh, and I have been to Pakistan, to Islamabad, to the Khyber Pass, uh, to the Silk Road, and, and uh, to the Afghan border. Yeah, uh, I was lucky enough because I, I joined, uh, I, I'm working in tourism last time, and I was uh, joining a, a a fair in Islamabad and, and had uh, the opportunity to, to get on that trip uh, on the very last minute. Uh, however, I must say uh, the topic right now, how to get information about insider tips, about what you can do, it's really difficult. I agree with that. You have to search on the internet, you have to ask the people, but but I can see actually there are plenty of small travel agents, there are plenty of hotels, boutique hotels who, who are really going an extra step. And this is what I feel, what the designing traveler, post-COVID, Generation C, they call them, but what these people are looking forward. The new traveler will look for sustainability, preservation of cultures, because they want to have an experience and they want to have this experience that that is uh, no longer in in the uh, developed countries no no longer uh, visible you want to meet other cultures you want to meet other people you want to be at a different environment to escape all your stress you want to th learn things that you are not able to learn at home so I agree with uh, you all that it's really difficult to find the right information. And that is one of the reasons why we are creating the World Travel Network, I believe. Because we should be, to my expectation, we should be an organization that is really helping the individuals and the SMEs and the people who are on the middle, uh, lower and, and, and middle uh, uh, areas not the big boys we should help those people to develop and to create the better travel experience for everybody and i'm with my full heart there to help if i can thank you rudolph uh, very insightful input yeah. uh, this is exactly what this discussion is all about not only world tourism networks launching but to bring uh, yeah travelers, practitioners, businesses, enterprises together and to start or to restart sustainable, experiential and truly inclusive tourism altogether post-COVID. So thank you. Um, that, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, truly exclusive. Yes, that is, that is uh, one of, of the big words that we are hearing nowadays because we're having a, a diversity of travelers and we're having the need of, of everybody to travel now out, everybody was locked down somewhere and uh, they want to go with the family they, and they have all the, the different generations together and they're looking for space. But I found out in my last, in my last job actually that that was a very nice, beautiful place with these big rooms, airy rooms in a wonderful natural environment. And this is what people like. You have a lot of space, you can bring your whole family something for everybody, you have nature. We found out or we feel that nature consumes viruses. So if you are in the nature, you are a bit safe from the virus. So people are less going to the cities. People are more looking towards the nature. And that is, that is exactly. See, yeah. Nepal has got the Himalaya eight mountains above 8,000 meters. And then you have places where no one has ever been to, right? Places like Mustang, yeah. absolutely in the nature. You will find one village after another, after 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers. So, But I doubt like, whether my grandpa can walk there. You might want to step in now if you want to highlight again why 
are we here so and what no, 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 we all know why, why we're here and i appreciate i just wanted to add something i got a, a whatsapp message um, okay. we have uh, people in high places watching us and thank you for this and i want to uh, thank our excellency Shaika my bin Mohammed Al Khalifa, and I hope I pronounced this correctly. She is the minister in Bahrain and she's currently running to become the next secretary general for the United Nations World Tourism Organization, UNWTO. And she writes that she's following this discussion and she said that she was amazed uh, by the work of specialized tour operators. Uh, one, she pointed out Travel Eyes, a tour operator for blind uh, travelers an initiative that makes tourism more than just a sightseeing activity. And she understands the importance of um, accessible uh, travel. And uh, she wanted to uh, just relate this. I wanted to relate this for her. So thank you. It's wonderful to hear that many uh, audience are there in live uh, streaming as well. So that's really great. And uh, as, as we, the discussion has move forward, it is to provide help in a very dignified manner, not the hindrances. And the tourism is not just uh, for the economy of the destination. If I say my personal observation and experience, it is highly lifting. People are empowered, truly. As I said, when Scott Rains came to Nepal 2014, many people, many Nepalese in Kathmandu and around, they had never been to Pokhara or Chitwan and they started traveling because they saw Scott coming all the way from California was riding elephant or taking ultralight flights and going to the mountain and they had never gone because they thought they would not be able to. So it, it allows to break the barriers the limiting belief. So in that way, inclusive tourism or accessible tourism is a good thing, not only for the tourism dollar, but also to lift up and empower the community in true sense. So on that note, Thomas, I think exactly we're hitting one hour, 59 minutes. So we want to close it on time. And since I don't see uh, other questions coming, I would like to thank uh, the panelist, Julie Kent. Thank you for staying up and sharing your views. Susil Adhikari, keep exploring. You are unstoppable and you share good positive vibes uh, all over wherever you go. Amrita Gyawali, a truly an activist who has been very humble and supportive to her community and also lifting up others. and encouraging people to travel. And as the saying goes, there's a quote that people come to Nepal for its mountains, but they keep coming back for its people. So that is not limited to Nepal. That applies to all destinations if, if the host really become receptive and hospitable. So on that note, let's Congratulate and wish all the best for WTN Network launching. Over to you, Jorgen. Yeah, and I wouldn't let you go. Thank you, uh, Frank. I wouldn't let you go that easy. Um, and I, I think this is such an important subject. And I know you have been working in this field for so many years. Uh, what makes you, uh, I think, um, really an expert, uh, not more than an expert in this field. And um, at WTN, of course, we're, we're building this organization brand new, we can go any direction we want. But one of the ideas is to have think tanks or departments or whatever we want to call, call it. And I think accessible tourism could definitely be a think tank with, on a global basis within WTN. And I would invite you and anyone else here uh, in this group uh, to be part of maybe such a think tank. Uh, so think about it. And uh, it's something we could introduce at our lounge in just a few days and you can get active and uh, maybe um, it could really make a difference uh, for for the industry because we're rebuilding this industry all of us at this point i also wanted to remind everybody uh, to go to wtn.travel you uh, click on the event banner and there are more events i think as i said we have 14 or 16 i believe right now listed and there are more coming um, so we have 
uh, actually, we have another session on accessible tourism tomorrow, um, I, I, about 2.15 Hawaii, so whatever time that is from the United States. And there are many, many other topics uh, before we go to our lounge uh, event on December 9th, where we also play then a summary of all the events, but you can always see the summary on Ethiopian News and everywhere else. Um, our keynote was released today, and this was the lady I just mentioned, um, Her Excellency uh, Shaika Mai from Bahrain. She will um, lead the uh, discussion on the future of UNWTO. This event will be an, uh, our event on WTN. So we did a little bit of shifting on the first event on the uh, 9th of December. We'll deal uh, with the chapters, we'll deal with the think tanks, and then on the 10th, we're trying to really get an outlook with experts on the future of UNWTO and the world of tourism. So we're looking forward to this. And um, anyone else who wanted to contribute, any great ideas you wanted to contribute with a discussion like this, you can still sign up. It's just on WTN.travel and click on event or WTN.travel slash uh, expo. That's where it is. And we'd be um, happy and pleased to uh, see you adding to hopefully to the success of our young organization. And Panka, I thank you so much for being the first. I know this was a little bit of a risk, but I think we all passed. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, a great uh, honor. Thank you for the invite and thank you for the opportunity. Let's give a big round of applause <laughs> and we are ready to clear. Thank you. Uh, okay. Aloha and, and, Aloha and uh, namaste everyone. Good night. Namaste, yes. Bye -bye. Thank you.